Welcome back to an episode of Brews and Business Podcast. I have a brief announcement before we get too far into today's episode. We have a new roast of as a single origin all the way from Costa Rica. This is what the new label looks like. Gregor and Coffee Roasters, our official roaster of the Brews and Business Podcast. This uh, lactic anaerobic fermentation semi-washed process. Uh, roast oil, it's light. This was actually roasted on 813. We have some sample bags, but anytime that you place an order, uh, they uh, they roast it and then they ship it. So it's roasted to order. Tasting notes of cherry cola, hibiscus. Uh, it's kind of like being lightened. That coffee just tastes that good. It is fantastic. <laughs> so good. Oh, I see. Uh, today we're thrilled to have a special guest, Eric Conkle, the head basketball coach of the University of Tulsa. Eric has an incredible background in coaching, having led teams to multiple 20 win seasons and postseason appearances. But beyond that, basketball court, Eric's approach to leadership, Team management and strategy is something every business leader can learn from. We'll dive into how Eric runs and manages his team with the same precision and focus as a successful business would. And stay tuned for some more insightful conversations. So let's get started. Eric, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. This is awesome. Uh, so how long have you been a coach? Uh, what, 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 what are you working on now? Kind of give us an update. Like, well, I'm dating myself. This will be year 25 in coaching coming up. Uh, 10, this will be season 10 as a head coach. I actually got started here in the University of Tulsa back in 2000 as a graduate assistant. It was transformative for me. I uh, thought and was uh, focused on becoming a coach, but that year really solidified it for me and then had a journey that took me to in my family to a number of places as a graduate assistant, as an assistant coach. Uh, from the University of Tennessee to George Mason University, University of Miami. Mm -hmm. And then I became the head coach at Louisiana Tech University in 2015. And then in 2022, was offered the opportunity to come back here to TU, which um, was a really a dream come true. Never would have thought that back when I was first starting. But we absolutely love it here. We're excited about the program, the university, and all the things happening. What, uh, what, are, you, what are you guys working on now, like trying to improve or change? Or is there anything like? Newsworthy on that side of things? Well, improvements are constant. And this is season three for us. We had an 11 game improvement from the year before. Our attendance wow. is up by 32% since we got here two years ago. Uh, fundraising, campus, there's so many good things happening at the University of Tulsa, not just in athletics, and, but their campus as well. We just finished an eight week training program with our team. They're on a little bit of a break right now. Then we start school on August the 26th. We'll start our preseason work and get ready for another great season. That's awesome. So being the head coach of TU basketball, it's almost kind of like running a business, right? Uh, I would say an associate of that. And you can play along with me on this too. So like your players are like employees. Uh, you manage budgets, right? Um, do you manage inventory? We do. What What else? What What other kind of things that you manage the schedule? Well, we, ha we have, so I have a staff, um, and that's part of my job is hiring staff. It's really the biggest job mm -hmm. from three assistant coaches, a director of basketball operations, a director of player development, a director of scouting and athletic and analytics. We created a director of creative content and branding when we arrived two years ago. Mm -hmm. We have graduate assistants, people that are starting out just like I did when I first arrived. We have student managers. Then we also work within a larger organization on campus in the athletic department. And then we have the players as well. So it's managing a lot of, as I say, hopes and dreams of a lot of different people, um, individual goals, but all then while formulating a real objective and vision for how to accomplish those team goals. Would you say that you're like the CEO kind of role, the visionary, the ones that finds the top tier talent? Uh, move move people's hopes and dreams like what you said kind of figure out what what they need and be able to support those people and right yeah without a doubt i mean i think i read a book many years ago it's called the dream manager by michael kelly and it was written in a way where it was more storytelling but the idea was as as the leader of any organization your most important thing is to make sure that the people feel like they're improving and that they are headed in the direction of what their dreams and goals might be. And so I want my assistant coaches to become head coaches. I want my GAs to become uh, full-time assistant coaches down the road. Want our players to become professional players and graduates, of course, and then be able to have a, a very happy and successful life later. 
but doing all those things, it's all within a team construct too, because we're trying to win conference championships. We want to get to the NCAA tournament. We'd like to get to a final four here at the university of Tulsa. But I really believe that uh, being able to help every individual member improve while yet feeling like, Hey, we're all headed in the same direction down the same rails makes everybody better. Hmm. Well, that, I, I think we, we both kind of feel that on, on our, um, on the, on the business standpoint, you know, you, you say you're trying to manage all these people, but really you're just trying to make sure everybody is improving, whatever that means. And, and a lot of times you got to look at yourself to figure out how you can improve to help them improve. And sometimes uh, it's not so a matter of how you can improve, but how can you set them up to, to improve? So one of the things you mentioned, which kind of correlates to, to Braden here, but the branding and content uh, department, you know, that was something that you guys created because why? Because there was a dream you guys felt you know, was needed and there was a support role you guys needed to create. And then came the role as, as Braden says, like the CEO, the business owner, where you got to find the right person to run that, you know? And then, um, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure very similar to Braden and I, where you're kind of like, well, what does that even mean? What does this role actually create? What does this do? What value do they bring to the business, to the team? And while we may not have physical, you know, championships, we want to make it to, or, or wins like that, they're very realistic goals of, of as team members, you take on these projects or these these games per se that you're like, hey, all right, guys, we, we're kind of in it. How do we get out of this? How do we come back? And and that constant involvement of how do you adjust to make sure that your team as a whole is still pointing in the right direction. Um, I know, like for right now, I'll put in perspective a very real uh, uh, idea of of trying to coach our people. But my partner and I have been dealing with we feel a very simple issue in, in the company and it comes down to we're like you know what maybe it, it comes down to we just got to get somebody from outside to come in and show them what what we're trying to tell them because a lot of times as we've noticed like in our kids sometimes you could tell them how it doesn't matter how many times you tell them but as soon as somebody else tells them it's like oh it all just makes sense it's like i've been telling you this like i my daughter's only six but i'm already getting this i'm like oh my gosh i'm not not looking forward to the teenage years it doesn't stop <laughs> you, you have kids <laughs> yeah i have two boys they're 15 and almost 13. Oh, so, man. Yeah, they. Uh, you're saying exactly the right thing, Gable, but it's not stopping. <laughs> you're not, seven's not better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. That's I, have you heard, uh, what, what's the, you made me think of a saying, you can't see the trees for the forest or something like that? I can't when see you're the in, forest from the trees. Can't see the forest from the trees. Right. You know, so like sometimes you do need that outside perspective right. to like come in and be like, what are you doing? Right. Let's figure it out. Because that it's almost kind of nice when someone has no clue how you function and how you work and and then to kind of un try to understand that and then try to help find those gaps right it fills you know, those that's holes. where those right a mentor or a coach or you know um i think it's important to have people that you can speak with confidentially have great trust that happens in our business all the time when there's people that you've worked with at other places um they're someplace else and it's hard for them to really have an understanding of what, how your university or how your athletic department functions, but you can always ask like, Hey, how, if you come across this situation, how have you handled it? What, what have you seen successful here? Or, and you got to have a number of people like that. Um, I've got a great staff. We've got incredible continuity. Um, we've worked together for a long time and have had a lot of success together. And I always encourage them as I encourage myself, let's, continue to talk to other people and get other ideas because just like business in basketball, the game is evolving. The business of college athletics is evolving and we've got to continue to move forward. What, what advice would you have for someone that's wanting to move into a leadership position? Um, and I guess maybe do you have someone near you that would take over your role at some point? Well, I think the, the number one thing is in coaching or in business, if you're wanting to become CEO, be a master of the role that you're in at this moment. Um, and then also look to take on more. It's it's not just saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to be able to sell in this region, but any opportunity that there is to volunteer or step up for somebody, take it. It gives you more experience. It shows the leaders in front of you and in the, in the uh, that hey, this person's really capable, this person is aggressive, this person's proactive, and then you go out and deliver. When that happens, you get more responsibility and more opportunities come your way. Man, I, I love that. That literally just happened in our business with that last job we took on. I took a lot of ownership behind it. And like you said, you kind of get out there and you're just showing that you can deliver. You're not just 
it's funny in my job a lot of things a lot of people are like oh you're just you're just out here selling jobs you can't actually do the work but whenever you're out there once a week and you're showing everybody that you, it, it it helps build that continuity right like guys understand that you do have the same vision as them it kind of puts you on that same playing field and understands that to some degree it, it hurts nothing to get out there and if anything i mean it felt good to be out there at the end of the day it, you're not mentally exhausted you're physically exhausted i slept great those nights but it's just a, a different way of, of relating to your team. And sometimes that's all they need is just you out there with them, you know, and it could be something that simple. Part of a leadership role, what I like to do is I like to remind my team that I work for you just as much as you work yep. for me. Yep. You know, I'm, I may write your checks. I may, you know, be the one to hire and fire ultimately, but I work for you. I'm here to support you. You know, that kind of made me think about that, st that statement and how I say that whenever you're talking about personal development and, curating help helping push them to their hopes and dreams right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. guiding them on that path reminding them like i'm here to make sure you're supported in your role and and guide you in the direction that you're wanting to go how do you how do you make time to focus on so many different people because that takes time to to help develop people right and to help understand and relate and know what their hopes and dreams are how do you manage that time yeah it's making sure that you have that time to communicate with everybody in your organization and finding uh and everybody's a little bit different there's people in different phases of life um but as ceo or a head coach it's making sure that you're communicating to them like hey how are you feeling let's talk about your where you'd like to go have your goals changed um how can we get there what can i help you with i i think there's something so powerful when you can just ask somebody hey what can i help what can i help and and then get that feedback. Mm -hmm. So we really try to, uh, not just at the end of the year, but throughout the year in giving feedback, but then also talking about a plan, um, like for an assistant coach. And I, I work for one of the best, uh, his name is Jim Larinaga. I worked for him for seven years at George Mason university for at the university of Miami, the hall of fame coach. Um, but he made a, he made it a way that you just felt like, Hey, this guy was really trying to help you and it actually made it hard to leave because you just felt appreciated but you felt um, driven you felt like you were pushed in directions that you felt a little uncomfortable but yet supported enough that it was okay to make mistakes right. Right. but he was great and um, certainly tried to take a lot of those things that he taught me onto our organization what performance metrics do you like to look at well there's so many i mean you know, in, in business, you're looking at sales numbers and where they're coming from or all those types of things for us. Of course, you have the end goal. It's wins and losses. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a very public thing. And <laughs> the, the beautiful thing about sports is there's a number of different ways to do it, probably a lot like business. And but there is a very intentional way that we want to be focused on a process that if we do things well here, the wins and losses will come. Yep. We're going to focus on our people, make sure that they feel safe, that they feel valued, that they feel like they're improving. And we don't want that to just be smoke and mirrors. Like we've got to make sure that they're improving. Right. And then we have some different metrics that we look at on the offensive end of the floor, the defensive end of the floor, in the weight room, um, in different skill um, me measurements from shooting drills and different things. And then try to piece that all thing together that turns into the end goals. And then we give guys feedback. Hey, you need to improve here. Um, you're doing great here. Keep it going. As assistant coaches, that's a little bit more challenging. It's not like, hey, you're leading us in sales and this and that. We don't live like that. It's more uh, position groups and how guys are doing and how we're doing as a group because it, the tide really rises all ships mm -hmm. in, in the coaching ranks. I like that saying a oh, lot. I thought you were going to say something. Oh, no. I, I was just thinking I, I like that saying a lot. We, we say that in the office a lot. It's just, you, you know, we, we have to have that pressure or else nobody's improving. It's just plain and simple. Did so, I ever show you my one sheet of like if I built my, I don't know, my, my perfect year. It had my had my some of my routines daily, quarterly, monthly, whatever. No. Mm -hmm. Where I wanted to be at 33, 35, 40, whatever. No. And I pinned mm -hmm. it up in my bathroom window uh mirror and then i also did it on my desk so mm -mm. the two two i'd see it in the morning right, right when i'm getting see it ready all day and, work. and then uh well okay so i'm gonna be i haven't touched it at all this year and i also haven't followed it but last year i followed it 
and it was amazing. But you did. So like one of the things that I did was I was like, okay, well, I need to make sure I'm physically taking care of myself. So where do I make time to be able to do that? So I figured out that, okay, I could get the kids off to school and contribute to my family in that way and still be there with them, not just ship them off to the bus necessarily. Right. And leave, but I could take them to school and then I could go to the gym and then I could, uh, hit the office between eight thirty and nine. Oh, me and the Chipotle CEO have the same routine. I found that one out the other day, a verbatim, like the exact same routine. We don't get home till about six, six thirty, dinner around seven, <laughs> shit, shower and go to bed. Like, <laughs> like that's a routine, that's man. Yeah. but, uh, but anyway, so like I, I wanted to make sure like every quarter, I'm sorry, every month I had a date with my wife out of the house. And then, uh, once a month I wanted to have a date with her in the house whatever that looked like. Maybe we just stay in and watch a movie. And then once a month, I wanted to make sure I did something with my boys. And then once a month, I wanted to make sure I did something with my family. And then I wanted to make sure I did something for myself. So like, I'd try to finagle that throughout the month. So like if I have four weekends, I could do two of those things a weekend. So I, if I could, if I could schedule that, right. Um, the goal is at minimum to like hit a certain number of those every quarter. So last year I did a really good job at that. And I did go to the gym frequently. Uh, so far this year, my best streak was 11 and then I broke it 11 weeks in a row of going at least three days a week for at least 30 minutes. And I would love to spend more time, (laughs) but again, where do you, who, and where do you take that away from too? You know? So when I was talking about how do you manage the time to like learn and develop with people, same thing that that's one of my things that I I wanted to work on with the rest of the team is let's build out some of your routines or some of the habits or things that you want to create to help further develop yourself personally outside of work. Um, and I wanted to like do like a vision board or do a, do some habit routine work or something like that with the team, probably close around Christmas when we kind of slow, slow down, you know, that, but that BTO kind of helped guide that a little bit. It? as you start to do it more. I mean, we're on year three with the VTO and uh, it really does start to change the way your team just kind of looks at, at goals and, you don't have to keep them accountable. They start to keep themselves accountable and break out their own goals long term. Um, but that'll start helping with the team. And then it, at least for me, it just carries on home. Everything carries yeah. on home. <laughs> so communication is really important. What techniques or habits or routines or meetings or whatever do you guys do to keep everyone in tune with what's happening and headed in the right direction? Well, I think you've got to, be truth tellers and got to be okay with that because conflict confrontation doesn't have to be nasty. It can be differences of opinion and we welcome that. It's not all of us continuing on the same path on on every single thing and just having total harmony. It's, it's, it's a fluid situation of coaching, evaluating talent. There's lots of different variables that come in and we want to communicate. And that's really the role as a leader that we're going to discuss this. This is a safe place. Let's, let's, let's disagree. Let's agree. Um, but once we leave this room, once this has been decided, and if I've got to make a, uh, the final decision to break a tie or anything like that, then we're completely in consensus leaving this room. And, and those are, that's leadership. It's making those tough calls, but, great communication in being truth tellers and then making sure that it's a safe place. This is never personal. This is all about, Hey, just how do we get to the best outcome? Because again, the tide rises all ships. We benefit all of us for when our players are doing great, our, our organization is doing great and we're pushing forward. The challenging thing is um, from a player perspective, you do the same type of things but then there's a there's a key component that makes it challenging. Some play, some play a lot, some don't play much at all, and that's hard. And and then again, as a leader, you've got to be okay with not everybody being happy with you. Just but you can be a, a guy that they look at and say, you know what, he's just really trying to do what's best for the team. He does care about me. He is investing in me. These are the calls that he's got to make right now. I hope that I've created a place for people to be able to constructively criticize and open communicate and say, Hey, what do you think about this? And be open to that honest feedback, you know, and, and also know that it's not me versus you. It's me and you versus the problem. 
or versus the thing we need to improve. Like being able to have that kind of perspective, I think is important, you know? Yeah. So then it's like, it's, it's, all, it's what me and my wife do. Like when we have issues, things that are happening in our lives, then we acknowledge with each other. And sometimes we have to remind each other, like, listen, I still love you. We're okay. But we have this problem. We need to address it. Like as if it's you and me versus this, I'm frustrated. I'm heated. You can tell that by my tone and my attitude, my body language, or whatever, but know that it's not directed towards you. I'm frustrated with this. Right. I, I like that because in, in kind of just agreeing with all you said, you have to be truth tellers. Right. And that's one of the things that I feel like I've learned the hardest is I, I read somewhere or somebody told me once that you can measure the value of a man by the number of difficult conversations he's willing to have. And it's like most of those times, those conversations are difficult, but it doesn't have to be bad. It's just it's a little uncomfortable until you create that space of safe and and. I remember whenever we started having those conversations in our business, it was really awkward. It was always really awkward. Just like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be going. I have a family run business, so that's even <laughs> weirder, right? Everybody's like attacking each other. I got to go then, home with you. Yeah, right, right. It's, it's completely different. But whenever you finally start to have those conversations and you catch yourself, and, and we do this now, we have a, a weekly level 10 meeting where we kind of just, everything's out on the table. Um, but I remember early on in the meetings, it was really kind of like, yeah, you could tell everybody was kind of reserved. And now everybody's like, you know what? We've been on these meetings long enough. I'm just going to tell how it is. And you just say things with your feelings, with your emotion, everything that you felt that week. And then afterwards, like, all right, so how do we solve that? Sorry, you felt that way. How do we come together to address that issue? Um, and it's really hard because people don't see it until you show it, right? Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody wants to be the one to bring up the issues. Nobody wants to be the, the truth teller. Because most of the time, the truth isn't coded in sugar. It's uncomfortable. It's pretty, right. It's, and, and really, it comes down to, it's like, well, but once you have those conversations, everybody goes home feeling much better. Because you didn't just hide it under the rug. You didn't sleep on that all night. It's like, oh, wow. So my boss is actually understands where I came from. You can okay, healthily that's, communicate right. those. And, and yeah. that's it. And then you get together, and it's like, uh, how, do, how do we solve this problem? Because honestly, we both hate this problem. So how do we fix it together? And then you start to realize that maybe you got to pull some resources from someone else, somewhere else, or you got to focus more time on something else. And, and having that ability to just say, Hey, I'm not going to let that conversation just go by the wayside. Let's sit down, let's talk about it. And then once we're done, it's done. And then you can move on. And I, I think that's, that's great. And that's a great way of communicating. Well, we, we also, in the delivery of truth, we mandate that it's, it's, it's not complaining and negativity it's it's addressing an issue and then come equipped with some type of solution, some type of um, suggestion that, hey, this this is an issue. I do think we could attack it with this. So because we have all you've all seen um, people or been around folks that, you know, they're they want to play devil's advocate. They they love to debate. You know, they, they want to put holes in a lot of different things and they may not be wrong. No, they're but very you, helpful. But you've got to be able to come with a solution too. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, just earlier today, we were we were watching some practice tape from the summertime, and we're looking at and we looking at parts of our defense and some different things that were just happening over and over again. And and we're talking about, hey, how do we address this? And it comes with a number of different options. That's a beautiful thing about basketball. Is first thing I, you know, guys got to play both offense and defense. It's not like you can segment them in other sports. But there's so many different ways you can do things, and many of them can be right. And so some of it's personnel driven. Some of it is what we feel most comfortable with in teaching, what we feel that would be most successful in our conference. And then you got to go out and do it. But you also got to know that there's going to be mistakes. And how do we make those and limit those as much as possible? But it causes great debate, and which is awesome. Oh, yeah. And I've it, ever heard the saying, all the monkeys in my office? Uh-uh. No. Okay. Well, maybe it's not a saying, but it is now. So, <laughs> so the, the idea behind that is um, when you said that someone brings a problem, you should have a solution to and talking about closure afterwards, whatever. So when someone comes into your office and they have a problem and there's no solution to resolve, you just have this monkey that's running around in your office. And it's somewhere in the back of your mind that there's a problem that just got brought to your table. Sometimes you can address it right then and there. Sometimes you can't. But if you have people doing that, all day, any day, throughout the week, whatever. Imagine all those monkeys running around in your, in your office. It's chaotic. It's hectic or whatever. So 
sometimes you got to give them some bananas and sit down with them and be like, all right, we're going to talk about this. Right. And that's accomplishment. Anyways, I don't, I didn't know if you've heard about that saying or analogy. No. no okay. No. Someone told me about it and I was like, oh, we're going to make it a thing. Now. Monkeys so. in the office. I get it. I kind of get it. I was also heard uh, yesterday. Uh, I was meeting with one of my clients and he is like, businesses are as unique as a thumbprint because their goals, their objectives, their people, their talent, their process, their, their revenue, their financial, everything is very unique. And even in a team perspective too, you, you, you know, TU basketball is not the same as, I don't know where uh, the thunders, like it's different, you know, even right. Everybody, like, right. There's so many differences in professional basketball. You can look at, well, their salary cap. What is their salary cap? They're different. Um, there's what teams are willing to go over the luxury tax, which teams uh, have a more maybe attractive uh, city that can provide more endorsement opportunities in college. We, we've got a number of different variables. Um, there's so many now there's, I mean, just what, what people might prefer, what type of environment they want to go in school, like public school, private school, big city, rural, um, of course, NIL is a big part of this now in decision making, academic programs, what are offered, what can they transfer into, what credits that schools will accept as transfer credit. I mean, there's so many different things that go into this now. And I think it's so important in any organization is figure out what you can be best at and what what can you be a real leader at in this one thing? Like, where is where are you focusing because uh, good is really the, the enemy of great, you know, coin the phrase from Jim Collins. But we absolutely feel like we can, we can be a leader in certain things out on the floor. We also think we can be a leader in some of our environment as a school. University of Tulsa is a small private school. This is not a place that people can come to hide. They can get a very personalized uh, environment academically, athletically, and just socially. Community. Yeah. Tulsa's small. Tulsa's All big those small. things. Yeah, I've, I've got a lot of <laughs> friends that have gone into you, and everybody just absolutely raves about to you. So it's it's definitely a personal, you know, you you want to go to TU. I mean, people, like I said, I've got friends that come from all over. It's like, how'd you end up in Tulsa? Uh, went to TU. It's like, wow, that's cool. I didn't realize that as I got older, but now I'm like, wow, I have a lot of friends go to TU. I didn't realize that. I like hearing that. Bring them back to the games. Have them come to the games. Talk games start it. November. In November. The first week of November, we start the season officially. Okay. That's exciting. You don't have a, do you have a schedule yet? It's not fully out yet. We're waiting on our conference schedule. The American Athletic Conference releases that in September once they get all the TV games organized. We still have a few games left in our, um, in our non-conference schedule, and so we're hoping to get that released here in the next few weeks. What what are you leading up to this season? What are you most concerned or frustrated about? Concerned, you know, as a head coach, you 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 live in a world of concern, just like you do as a CEO, where you are trying to see things that are coming. You know, some things that you already have to tackle. Some things might be constant. Some things that you really can't control. You got to be able to move those to the side and focus on the things you can control. But I know for us, uh, out on the floor, I absolutely are concerned with how do we defend better? How do we defend the ball better? How do we keep the ball out of the paint? How can we defend without foul fouling? On the other end, how can we take care of the basketball better? These are things that ailed us last year and are just constants in the game. If you do those things pretty well, you're going to have yourself a shot. And then off, off the floor, I concern myself with how can we continue to be on this path of being one of the most inclusive coaching staffs and continue to uh, and, um, be uh, connected to our community because we are the University of Tulsa. We want to represent Tulsa as, as the city's team. And so anything that we can do coming on podcasts like this, meeting at uh, people at different places, speaking at events, we want to be able to do. How do you motivate the team? You a carrot or stick method <laughs> or something else? I don't know. Well, a little bit of both. I, I, I think, I think that's an awesome question. And I, and I think in any business, there are some tells in the evaluation process, hiring process, recruiting process of finding out who the most self-motivated people are, because that's the best motivation. You can figure out which guys uh, or ladies are, are just highly motivated to improve. And then 
but always, especially on the basketball, and this is where in any team sport is how do you motivate someone who has high, high individual goals that's highly invested in their development to yet play for the team and play for other people too. And that's where the true motivation I think comes through as a head coach um, with your team, with your players and, and showing them that um, maybe a few less shots here, but at a higher percentage efficiency is actually better for you than taking a bunch of tough shots and scoring more points per game, that it's all really about efficiency. And you do that a number of ways. Maybe you bring in an NBA scout or a podcast, or you listen to some guys that are at the NBA level that have done it and they speak on it. Like just using all those different tools to educate. Hmm. I like that. How do you motivate your team? That's a good question. You go get a I, stick out of the yard? No. I mean, here lately, I, I, well, I feel like, like I said, our last job, Chance, you know, kind of left us recently, but the last job that we did was one of uh, Chance's family members, and I, I motivated by showing them, you know, you could do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was one of those moments where the guys have been, they've been doing great all summer long, but when it's 110 degrees and you're like, hey, we're going to be stuck at this job site for a month, people tend to get demotivated pretty quickly. They're like, wait, we're doing what? I'm like, yeah, we're going to be in this five foot section of a yard for a month and it's going to suck and it's 100 degrees. And everybody's excited at first, of course. Everybody's like, all right, we're going to, but it doesn't take long for everybody to just kind of start just getting tired of seeing the same thing every day. Right. And uh, I just, I, I felt like for that particular job, I motivated by just being out there and just saying, hey, look, I don't know how we're doing this. We're going to figure it out together. And ideally, if I'm out here one full 10 hour day on 110 degrees, you guys can tackle it the other four days of the week. Um, and it really worked. But now that's the guys in the field, and I'm not really in touch with them anymore. Uh, I more or less just do sales and managing the team, the the, the office. Um, and when it comes to them, man, here lately, I've realized the easiest way to motivate the team is just giving them, giving them support, giving them freedom. The truth, the matter is, you know, I you gotta you gotta trust your team before they can trust themselves sometimes. And here lately, I've just been saying, hey, this is my customer. I'll let you make the biggest, I'll let you make the decision. This is the job. I'll let you make the decision. Um, and it's some, some super simple stuff. Um, but a great example is uh, when we started that job, typically I would go out there, I would paint this whole job site out ready to go uh, for whatever reason I couldn't. So I, I just said, hey, you guys got it. Here's my drawing. I, there's no measurements on this. Here's just a drawing and an idea. And they hit this drawing almost spot on without me even being there. And that was just a moment of just trusting that we've been doing this long enough together that they should know. And they, they killed it. Uh, and then it, that same project just yesterday, something really simple. But when you're working on a really beautiful landscape where somebody really spent some money on it and you go to put in handrails, you know, I in the design phase just spec a handrail what you would normal, normal bathroom ADA handrail. Um, and my guy goes to Lowe's and he's like, Hey, I'm supposed to get these rails. I don't like it. It looks like a pool rail. And I said, okay, so what? He's like, I'm going to have to get a different one. Cause the, the job's too nice. I can't do that. I'm like, oh, fantastic. Well, I love it. Thank you. That's, that sounds like a great solution. Um, and then today, right before we walked in the podcast, he texted again, Hey, that's not going to work. The concrete's cracking. I think the best idea is to pull the whole pier out and report it. I hate that answer, but it's the right answer. So let's do it, you know, and being there and supporting and saying, you guys will know best. I know best on certain ends and on other ends, I'm just going to have to support and I'm going to trust you guys do the best. And sometimes I don't like the answer because it costs more money or I didn't factor that or whatever it is, but you have to support that whenever they make that call, that is the right call, even though you didn't account for it, trust them. And next time say, Hey, what can I think about in the future? about this project or so on and so forth. And it sounds silly, but that 18 inch handrail in silver instead of black would have just been hideous in this whole backyard. And it's like, <laughs> I love that. I, something so simple, but without giving him the support in the past of, Hey, you've got it. I don't care. Even if it costs more money, we let's make sure it, that's our name. That's our name. That is everything that we represent. So even if it comes down to a simple little handrail that I don't care if it costs more, but just, we can't do that to that project. And it's, yeah. That's, you know, it's good motivation whenever somebody's like, okay, I can do that. And my boss isn't going to be mad or he's going to be like, no, you make it right. Make it right. We'll figure it out on the yeah. back end. I remember when I worked at Quick Trip 15 years ago, ish, 16. And I remember working for certain managers, GMs or assistant managers, things like that. And they, 
they got this kind of power hype where I'm at the cash register and you're the, you know, the clerk that goes out and takes out the trash and power washes this and restocks, blah, blah. But there were some managers I worked for that did that. And then there was those, there was a few that were the opposite. They were like, you take this, which is what I would normally do. And I'll go take out the trash. And it created a lot of respect and made me feel supported that I'm not just, you know, Pee wee clerk or mm-hmm. whatever. So it kind of makes me think about how I try to do some stuff like that here. I don't mind taking out the trash and doing things that aren't my job. I also understand too, that I'm better in some areas than others. So maybe, <laughs> you know, you should take this and you should own it and I shouldn't touch it, but I don't mind stepping in. If you need my help, you know, I don't mind back be your backup on it. Yeah. But those, those are definitely good ways to show support and going into the, some of that conversation. How do you delegate? Cause the, you know, the classic saying there's no I in team. It, it's really, it was one of the tra- most challenging things moving from an assistant coach to a head coach. And because you're used to being one of those guys that was handling more um, player related issues in a closer proximity or other things, you had more specialty. Whereas moving over to a head coach, you've, you're seeing the big picture. But what you got to be able to do is you got to be able to teach others. You got to be able to teach others and yet put them in positions where they can be most successful and put a team together that can accomplish all the things that you need accomplished. So that's, uh, you know, I, I had some times early on in my head coaching career where I had, I had assistants that moved on very quickly and was having to train younger staff members, younger assistants and trusting them quicker. And that was challenging because there was a way that as a head coach, you remember what you were like as an assistant, the things that you did for your head coach and how, how you wanted it done. But at the same time, it's so important to know what people's strengths are, put them in positions that they can ultimately be very successful, train them in the things that they're a little bit weak at that will benefit them down the road, but always, always put square pegs in square holes and be able to utilize the people the best way possible. But it is a challenge um, delegating and letting go. But the most important thing is hiring great people, putting them in a position, giving them a vision and letting them roll, much like you said, Abel, with your group. How do, how do you adapt to different groups of team members, different kids, different almost generations to some degree with as long as you've been in this game? How do you Do you have to adapt to different leadership styles to fit the needs of your team? Oh, without question. I mean, you know, there's a, uh, when I first started, we texting wasn't allowed. I mean, it wasn't even really happening as a part of the recruiting process, much less how you manage your team. Um, online games were not a, a big deal. Like there's, there was no social media. There wasn't those pressures that came from it or the content that came from it. That's why we hired that director of creative content and branding. But I think you always got to be able to evolve. The game has evolved. There's way more three point shots taken now than there was 20 years ago. Why? It's because people are better at it. And the analytics say that the percentages of three point shots made, I mean, in the NBA, uh, if you look back, the Lakers who were the Showtime Lakers in the 1980s with Magic Johnson, they, they, they would shoot like six, three point shots a game. That's everything else was taken straight to the hoop. Everything was mid range jump shots, post ups, it's it's uh even the Suns under Dan Dan uh, Mike D'Antoni who were the fastest team in the NBA by far they'd be like middle of the pack now uh, much or even a little bit less mm-hmm. so the game changes people change society changes however with all that said we we still continue to ground ourselves in three things and we talk about them all the time we recruit to them we we want guys with great attitudes we want energy givers. Two, we want a, a commitment, total and unconditional commitment to, to the, our team, our program, and to their own development, to be passionate about what they do. And then third, class, we want guys behaving in a first-class manner. So no matter what all the noise is or what all the other instances that go on in life, we're going to ground ourselves in those three things. And we hold everybody in the program, myself included, accountable to that. I like that. Wow. Core values. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's maybe in that category but i think more into the per uh yeah yeah per, yeah sure core values you can name it whatever you want yeah. we call it we call it program philosophy but it's absolutely core values yeah. um yeah. and we talk about it all the time from 
the three things that we can control always, you know, attitude, effort, and body language um, to, you know, we, we talk often uh, about making that total unconditional commitment because you guys remember what it's like to be 18 years old, um, especially going off to college where you're on your own for the first time. There's, there's just uh, an abundance of decisions to make with yeah. your time. When I turned 18, I got a one-way ticket to New York and I said, bye. <laughs> I didn't know when I was going to come back or anything. I wasn't there that long, but I was exactly out, out in New York, just winging it, man. I found <laughs> exactly right. some internships, hit up some jobs, like work for free some places. Like it worked. Yeah. But, yeah. but exactly. Like you said, that's a, it's a whole new world at that age. And you know, I, I feel like we as parents do what we can to, prov- to, to set our kids up for success. But you mentioned that. But you know, in the whole realm of of I heard this the other day, right? Where we as parents are coaches, our our kids are the players. You can't play the game for them, right? And for us, that is in a sense the first time we we play the game without coaches around. As leaders, we like, almost wow, have two families. Yeah. We have one at work and one at home. And I yeah. I think it's a different kind of perspective. If I was an employee somewhere, I wouldn't feel that necessarily. I wouldn't feel like I'm I may feel I'm a part of the family, but I don't feel like you are the family. I am in charge of the family and yep. how the family's doing and how we're thinking and growing and developing and financially, whatever, like you're the patriarchy. Yeah. 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 So like i I'm the head of two households, not just one. Right. What lessons have you learned? So uh, maybe over your career or in a short, short time span, is there anything recent long-term either one? Yeah. The biggest one and this was fairly recent is control what I can control. And I, I think if, if the time with the pandemic and COVID taught us anything was that. Uh, I'll never forget when things were starting to unfold um, back in 2020, we were getting ready to play in our conference tournament. We were picked to win it. Uh, We had a really good team and all of a sudden everything gets shut down and gets canceled. And, and as a head coach or CEO, you want to be able to have answers of, of things that are happening and didn't have them and didn't have them for quite a while and all we could do was the absolute best that we could do with the information that we had now you go forward in college athletics there's so many different things that have happened since then with all the different lawsuits and different types of things um, that have hit the ncaa and how we do business and how we manage our team and i think it's so important just to say Hey, I'm aware of this. I've educated myself on this. I can't do much about that, but this is the way that we can evolve and going forward. What I think is best here. And I spend really little time worrying about that other stuff. That's good. That's good. I mean, attitude shapes it all. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. And I love that you bring up COVID because I, I similar situation whenever that COVID went on, I remember saying to my, to my brother, I said, Hey, this is going to be the worst or the best thing that's ever happened to us. Let's make sure it's the best. And we made it through and it's been awesome. And then now, you know, everybody's like, oh, we got a possible global recession coming on. Well, I'm like, hey, this is the best or the worst thing that could happen. Let's make sure it's the best. How do we make sure we take advantage of the opportunities that will present themselves? Because there's always challenges, but we will find opportunities if something happens and so on and so forth. But it's like it's the attitude, right? You, that's one of the most, the, one of the biggest things you can control in your life that really does dictate how, you know, play out on the, on the back end. Well, I know, you know, we're all parents and I I think it's so important that mistakes are part of this equation. Um, You know, our guys are in the weight room. They did a great job this summer, but they only got stronger because they, they lifted some weight that was a struggle. Like they struggle creates that growth. Now, some things you want to be strategic about in planning for that. Um, There's certainly things that you want to be able to, to stay away from but you've got to be able to create adversity. You've got to be able to grow and you have to be able to understand that mistakes are part of growth. If, if you're living in a cautious, very safe zone all the time and not taking any chances that you're not really trying to push the envelope to get better, you're really going to get worse because there is no standing still. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. I like it. There was a saying I was trying to think about, about being stagnant. I can't remember what it was. I don't know, something about stagnant and moving. It was very motivational. I wish I could, if I think about it, I'll, I'll say something. Right, All right, you ready start? to hit those? Let's do it. So if you guys don't know, these conversation, 
uh, the diary of a CEO is a podcast in the UK. And these are questions that people have brought to the table and asked in the, in the podcast. And they, uh, we bought the deck of cards and, uh, supposed to help develop raw, unfiltered conversations really hit home. One of the questions that was uh, asked last time was what were, what's something that you would like to pay more attention to that you haven't, you know? And so like some of those kind of questions. So we all said our family. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to ask professionally or personally. Uh, you, you it, all, it all intertwines. You know, it does. It yeah. does. When you're, when you're get to that point, it does all intertwine. You can't really separate both. You, it's hard when you love both so much, right? They both bring you so much joy. But uh, that's a battle we're always talking about is just that balance. But anyways, the question, this is a good one. Um, it's kind of different, but how many times have you properly been in love? And that's by Pierce Morgan. Properly been in love? I believe that says properly been in love. Three times. <laughs> maybe maybe I say properly twi- uh, once once okay. properly once but i mean there's there's i've had uh three relationships i'm on i'm married to the third one so properly is a difficult question but properly that's so broad yeah right right and i have to say too because i've only had like you know i'm not a man of many ladies i've only had two serious relationships and my current one i've been with her for 11 years and don't plan on messing that one up for the next you know 111 years in our love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> after death you know. you know you know i think about i think about life and 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 what love means is is another word for passion right and things that you're passionate truly passionate about i mean i think there's no greater love than the love for your children and Ooh. and and how that manifests itself that it's immediate the moment that they're there oh yeah um uh i've been married 21 years we we dated before that for four years uh absolutely properly and i'm not exactly sure what properly means but uh in, in love with my wife megan and then you know i i i i love what i get to do every day too and and that's a different type of love it's certainly down the the scale from from my wife and kids but um I absolutely love what I get to do. I mean, being a coach, uh, doing it at TU in this community, uh, being around the guys and the people I get to work with every day. I mean, there's a, there's certainly a love for that. Yeah. I, I love I'm that. In you, love. Yeah. It's hard not to be uh-huh. right. Yeah. I, I, I love that you brought He's got that three up. daughters. Did yeah. you say that earlier? I didn't say, I don't He's know got three said. daughters. Three daughters. So it's, it's a fun house full of ladies. I've got two <laughs> boys and a daughter. Yeah. But, uh, I love that you bring that up, that the whole difference in the way we see love. Cause that's something that I'm learning just now of as men what really brings us joy what really brings us happiness and we talk to mostly men on the podcast and you find we we tend to be pulling ourselves in two directions work or home right and it's because we we genuinely love being creators and builders and providers and when we find that thing that we genuinely just love doing it's it's hard to say it it, when your when your wife says you know you're working too much it's like i'm just I'm just in love. You know, I'm just working. It is what it is. And and someone has to do it, but you know, it, but it's just work. It's like, well, it's, it's, it is, but it isn't. Cause I kind of love doing it. You know, it's, it's a uh, interesting, I love that you brought that in. Cause it, it is a different type of love for well, sure. Let me tell you this story. And um, so I'm the oldest of three and I grew up in a little community called Amherst uh, in central part of Wisconsin. My, both my parents grew up on dairy farms and my dad was in the construction. He, he started out as a carpenter, then became uh, a foreman, then the superintendent of different projects. And I think there's there's great books that talk about tipping points. Malcolm Gladwell wrote about tipping points, and we all have them in our life. Society has them, and when certain things happen. But I, I remember being 12 years old, and my dad he worked from seven seven to three thirty. And I remember him coming home and in, in Wisconsin in the summertime, it gets really humid. And I remember him walking into the house and was just exhausted, had this old lazy boy chair and sticking his legs up. And he asked me to help him take off his boots. And normally as a 12 year old, like, oh man, your feet are going to stink. Why? Yeah. I could tell like he was, he was <laughs> he exhausted. Was beat. Yeah, he was beat. And so I take his, I take his boots off. And then um, back then we, we were way out in the country. We had three channels and if the weather was good for and and I was the remote most times. They're like, holding hey, it up, like. you know. Turn, you know, Eric, <laughs> turn the turn the channel to eleven, 
And I just remember sitting there and, and then him looking to me and saying, I'm 12. And he goes, hey, one day you're going to have a job. Just make sure it's something you love to do. And it's not like my dad hated construction. Um, there was a lot of things that he didn't enjoy with it. He actually really enjoyed working with his hands and seeing things created. There was a lot of the stress that came in the management role that he didn't enjoy so much. But I really became on a mission. At that time, I just wanted to play basketball. And then as I saw that starting to, uh, I was a realist too, that I wasn't going to do that for a, a real career uh, for very long anyway, and really was on a, just on a soul search of what's going to make me happy because success can only come after happiness. A lot of people think it's the other way around. Once I become successful, my bank account gets to a certain level. Yes, you might be comfortable, but true happiness comes from when you have a, an enjoyment and a fulfillment and a satisfaction of the things that you're either creating or the people that you're with or all the different things that happen. And so you know, I give my dad a lot of credit for planting that seed in me. I, I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. I, I love it. It's kind of a problem because someone's like, what hobbies do you have? And I'm like, building processes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. And then yeah. I was like, okay, this is kind of bad. Maybe I should have some hobbies. Like yeah, right. I don't have, like I used to, I played sports for uh, basketball, 14 years, uh, football for three, soccer for two, Taekwondo for a few years. And then I did uh, BMX for a few years. I did no, some other sports too. I, was I did. Uh, I did bowling for four years. That's a sport. Yeah, I know. I got, um, my, got my butt kicked in it like a month ago. Yeah, but if you ever go bowling against American Waste, you're gonna get obliterated. Like any the American Waste in Tulsa has an actual bowling team. Do and, they? And what? We we went bowling with them, and they scored 300 points on the first game. They scored 298 points on the second game. And 298 points on the third game. My highest score was only 189. <laughs> Dude, it was That's bad. still pretty good. We yeah, took our whole team bowling uh, about a month ago and got to see uh, all these big athletic guys and trying it. And some hadn't done it for the first time until that point. But it was fun. It's fun. It, it, it was it's fun. It's hard not to have fun bowling. It was fun. I mean, we had a blast. But it was like definitely, wow, you guys are you guys aren't even trying. <laughs> it was bad. It was practice for them. And we were out here like trying to compete against them. It was It was really fun. What kind of team activities do you like to do? So we do a number. I mean, there's, there, there's, a, there's a number of different things. So one thing is we live not far from campus and we'll just let out bring the guys over to the house and cook and we'll bring our coaches, their wives, their kids. Like we really want to create and, and make it feel um, like, a, like a family environment here. And that's what we want. But we'll do other things from – team bowling night. Uh, we took the team fishing. We had a bunch of guys who never caught a fish before. Um, that's cool. That's we, crazy we, to we think did, about. We did. Uh, Speaking of fish, I caught like, we, me and my brothers went camping. We caught like 45 fish at the river. Oh, wow. It was crazy. They were biting. We've got rare. some guys that are awesome at it. Like they're yeah. elite. I'm terrible. And then we had some guys <laughs> that, catch. that, you know, came from a big city and then just like, right. I've never fished before. Like I've never caught a fish in the smiles on their faces, guys, 20, 21, 22 years old. I mean, <clears throat> awesome. Um, we've, we've done team paintball before we've done different exercises of, you know, telling of, of communication of, of, of things where, Hey, from tell, tell somebody, the guy to your left of what you think that they're really good at. Um, as we've gotten closer as a group, tell them what, what you think that they can improve, they can improve at like, that's some more challenging. Um, we've done, we did kickball games. We've done, I mean, this is over time, the not just this summer, but I, I think it's so important to bring a human element into this whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, the competition and the, the, um, camaraderie and communication, all and, that stuff yeah. and just the experiences of, of fun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with each other is really important. You want to do an ARC versus sooner on paintball? Oh, that'd be fun. Dude, I have way more people. No, no. It, it, you can only have certain numbers, oh, like 5v5 yeah. or 7v7. Actually, it you know what? Equal. Yeah, because we've gone shooting and we're going again on the 23rd, so I'll make my list of who I want on our team. Yeah, we'll be all right. I want to do it like, <laughs> I do it like September, October. Oh, yeah. We're going shooting next weekend, so I'll, I'll definitely take my list down of who's on my team. We even okay. did laser tag one time in the in the arena. Made it dark. Oh, no way. Got, like, light enough so you could see the obstacles and stuff. But And we typically do play, players versus coaches. It's wild. Oh, yeah, that's fun. wild. Uh, something that I just thought of while you were saying that, and the only reason I thought is this, because this guy, the other day we were working out here, maybe have all the guys go ride some equipment, drive some equipment around. We were out here and this guy had, he was like, I had never ridden a tractor before. I'm like, that's a mini skin. That's an everyday tool. And he's like, this is the first time I've ever gotten. I'm like, 
That's crazy. I'm but, a real boy. <laughs> but right, but it's that it's that feeling, right? Like you said, some people have never even been fishing before, and it, all being mostly men, you know, it's like man, it's fun because a lot of kids i know me growing up i always saw equipment and i thought that was the coolest thing you know my dad was a truck driver and now i'm like man my kids think the trucks are the coolest things and they are the coolest things and they don't get to be around it all day but now they get to be around all this equipment they think it's nothing but that's just our everyday life and and for some people it's like wow i never thought i'd get to drive a skid steer did like, i earn like my a seven year old daughter's driving it right now <laughs> <laughs> did i earn like a new man status when i got to drive it I mean, is there like no. a little like card or check mark or it, no no <laughs> badge <laughs> No, I think Osho will give you one if you go to a class, but I won't give you one. They'll probably give you a fine. Let me yeah. drive it. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. But uh, is he employed? Is he going to be covered under work? That's what they're going to ask, yeah. right? But uh, he shouldn't be touching that. That's something like that would be fun for a bunch of grown men. You know, if you ever think of, you know, just driving equipment, you can reach out. I've got equipment that could come play on. That'd be fun. You know, oh, I, all those things. I, I as long as they're safe, right? I mean, that's not something I concern myself with, but. Like the guys that that we work with, the, these players, if you look at it, they're, they're really in the top 1% of all players that play basketball in the entire world. To be a Division One scholarship basketball player is a hard thing to do. They're obviously very, very accomplished at it. They're talented at it. I think it's so important to do things that are fun, but also makes them a little bit vulnerable. Um, I mean, we've gone to golf suites before and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and had everybody hit, like, not everybody does that. Um, some Level guys the playing are, field. <laughs> just, just do some different things that – that are a little bit unusual that you can look back at and say, Hey, that was fun. I'm glad I tried that. This is a safe place to do it. Um, I, I look very going back to the whole thing is, is creating an environment again, that's safe, but that's fun too. Like we get to do this. I remind our guys all the time. We get to do this. Uh, we are so fortunate. You talk about another team exercise that, and things that you can do. We will do it's typically on Fridays and we'll even call it appreciation Friday is we'll have our guys write a, a note to somebody in their life that has impacted them in a positive way. And um, early ones are typically a parent, could be a coach, could be a teacher, could be somebody even on the campus at TU that's assisted them in some way. And it's not to get something back, but the feeling they do end up getting back is how happy that person becomes. And it's so important. And the real thing of this all for me is for, for each of us to realize that, in my opinion, there's no such thing as a self-made man. We've all had help along the way from somebody. And to recognize that, to make sure that we show appreciation because having gratitude gives us a level of joy regardless of our circumstances. And that helps us in the great times, the tough times, no matter what's in front of us, to just keep pushing forward and know that we get to do this. Think that just about. Do you have any questions for us? I've spent the last hour asking you questions. So that's a good one. Um, you know, I'm fascinated with business, and I know you said, uh, Abel, you're in a family business. Yes, sir. Did you start the business, both of you guys? Did you start this from scratch? Was this something that you that you took on? That I started Sooner Marketing and Blue Studio ten years ago, but when I left for New York in 2012, when I graduated, went to New York worked for a handful of agencies, came back, had some jobs, did some things on the side, worked for them remotely, one or one of them remotely. Um, and then two years later, uh, did a little bit of business, had $5,000 in cash. And I was like, all right, next month I'm out. I'm going to do my own thing. And I did. And I started, uh, it was Sooner Websites at the time. And then in 2016, it was renamed to Sooner Marketing. The whole idea is to uh, create marketing solutions that deliver sooner results. I like that. Yeah, he is. Yeah, for us, um, kind of happened by accident. I had been trying to start a business. Multiple, I always do. Uh, kind of going back to earlier, you said your dad had told you you wanted you to find something that you love. My dad used to drill into my head, I want you to work because you want to, not because you have to. And before, before I had the time to tell him thank you for all of that, I, I just kind of – like, yeah, but dad, you never told us how to do that. Like, I love the idea, but you never told me how to actually do that. Um, so I, I figured out business. Uh, that was the way I was going to create something that I loved. And uh, I was at a point in my life where I just wasn't very happy anymore. And my brother offered me a terrible position at a huge pay cut to come work outside from inside an office. And I was like, yeah, I'm ready to get out of these four doors or four walls. Um, and I lasted there about a year before that company closed the doors. And 
just so happened that we had a little bit of money in the bank and I bugged my brother who had been in the industry for quite some time. And I said, dude, let's start a business. Let's start a business. And then finally people started asking and my brother and I started a business out of nowhere with this idea that we were going to create opportunities for our family. We weren't sure what those opportunities were, but we wanted to create opportunities for our family. And we were going to be honest with everybody and anyone. The fact that we, we went to work one day and the gates are literally closed and that's that is kind of like a, that's, that's a crappy feeling. You know, you're just like, oh, thankfully we had a little bit of money in the bank and God had been at play months before that, looking back now. Um, but uh, we just kind of got started like that. And, and very quickly because of, you say, nobody's a self-made, self-made man. Very quickly because of our relationships and the people that, that we had supporting mm-hmm. us, we were able to hire employees and kind of get off the ground. And, no iron team? Yeah, right. And, and right now we are, uh, we're shifting to... I get my first sales guy coming in on Monday, so I'm officially going to try to replace myself and hey, step I think away me from too. the business. Yeah, so it's it's exciting, you know. But we started from from scratch, um, and it's been it's been fun. I love it. I, I people ask me what my favorite part about business, what I do. It's like, well, I like the business part. Like I hate the work, but I love the business. I love meeting the people. I hate yep. I hate the physical aspect of the work, but I just love the game of business. Do you ever play the, Monopoly? For sure. It's that in real life. Yeah. yeah it's scary it's as shit. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> you, yeah. At least then you can walk away from the board game. This you can't, yeah, you walk, can't away. walk away like, from. Like you're handcuffed. I'm a, I'm unemployable well, at this that, point. And that's that's a very realistic. <laughs> like if I fail yeah. at this, either someone's smart enough to be like, you're hired. Like I saw how hard you work. That's crazy. Uncontrollable factors. That's why you went out. I'll hire you. I hope that happens. If maybe if that happens. If that happens, I don't know. It won't happen because you, you won't. That, that's the thing is yeah like, if world war three happens we, comes here all the way to oklahoma maybe i don't like in that aspect i guess i don't know well i, I just say that because you know for us there's uh the whole aspect of starting the business uh, i've had people ask and like we talk about you know kind of trying to foresee the futures what does it take to start a business and it's like well burn all the bridges Quit. burn all the boats go that's it yep. you know and, and you'll figure it out along the way kind of i'm sure similar to coaching similar to the way you, you lived your life is well you figure it out as you go and and uh, we started as a, as a dream to provide opportunities for everybody and get myself out of giving. My dad was a truck driver and all I ever wanted was my dad home. So all I'm trying to do is be the dad that's at home. Um, but I realize now as an adult that, well, somebody's got to pay the bills, you know, and then I loved having my mom at home 24 seven. And that's the one thing that I, I cherished more than anything was getting off the school bus and smelling the food that's cooking inside. Mm-hmm. Like I remember that walking in and just, a stack of snacks and it's like I, my kids deserve to have that same thing so we'll go through the sacrifices and whatever we've got to do right now but how do i get home faster um so like i said that's where the whole business thing started and we kind of it's been good man it's been life's good life life is good well it sounds like all three of us are very lucky and uh and i was told once that if if the career path you've chosen and the job that you're in causes you to wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it in some way. Something could be excited. Something could be a problem you're trying to solve. Uh, you've picked the right thing. It sounds like all three of us have done that. That oh, happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wake up and be like, oh, okay, well, I think we're good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Man, um, Eric, I really appreciate you joining us and having these conversations. It's It's been nice kind of getting, I guess, getting into your head and seeing your point of view on things and, how you've developed over time and stuff. And it's exciting to hear um, all the things you're doing at, at TU and as a head coach and stuff and, and bring a little human element to some of this too. So you're, you're not just out there being like, go that way, go this way, catch that. You know, I don't, you know, when you're out there on, on the side, it you got a gets job intense. You got a job to do and stuff, you know, so it's cool to kind of understand what it's like in your world. And again, try to correlate that to, to us and what we do in business and how that's same and, and what you do, you know? Well, we appreciate, I appreciate you guys having me on and certainly counting on you guys to come, come to the games. Let me know. Yeah. We'll get some tickets for you guys and, okay. and people in your respective businesses and come join us. Yeah, that sounds great. We'll, we'll have to have an outing and we'll yeah. do that. We'll do that. Sure. Game. That'll be fun. Is there a particular uh, competitor uh, that would be good to come watch with you guys? Oh, that's a great question. Well, there's a number. I mean, the, uh, and we'll have a, a number of home games. We'll have nine in the conference play. Um, we'll have at, at least another nine in the non-conference play. Of course, uh, we'll have ORU in the Mariners Cup. That that 
the inner city game that it's played. Um, we've got Oklahoma State coming to play us. You guys smoked them last year. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> have, we're gonna have uh, Oklahoma State, so we've got two in-state games at least. So we've got we'll have a number of games. As as we say, they're all big. Uh, as a coach, they're all yeah. big. They're all important. But of course, there's there's some that we know our fans get a little bit more excited about than others. Okay, great answer. Appreciate yeah. that. Awesome. All right, so uh, again, you got to go grab this new Costa Rica coffee. Uh, you can find it on our website. It's or, uh, roasted to order. Uh, you can get the sample. It's like 10, 15 bucks. You can get like five pounds of it. I think it's closer to like 70 bucks, 100 bucks. But it's worth it. It's totally good. He's also got a subscription to where if you don't want to remember to get coffee, you can just or have a 50 pound bag, a five pound bag. Chilling. Five pound bag yeah. I mean, I've got a five pound bag of espresso it's, beans chilling in my it's office different. right now. That's different. It's different. Same, same, but, but different. Yeah. That comes up all the time. I don't know how to do that. And then you got the cool can cooler glasses, the pint glasses, the hats, the, all the cool merch stuff. So uh, leave a review, like, comment, share. Let us know if there's any other guests that you would like to see on the show. Uh, we'll, we'll reach out to them, bring them on. And uh, Eric, appreciate you again. Thank you. And you got it. we'll go to a game. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. All right.